As with everyone else in the world, our travel plans were turned upside down with the advent of COVID-19 in January of 2020. We decided to try and work around the pandemic by squeezing in as many short excursions as possible. In February, Jenny flew to Grants, New Mexico to meet up with her sister Rose and her nephew Eric, who works for the National Park Service at El Malpais National Monument. The first place they visited was the Bistai Badlands, a place that we had been to a few summers ago. Centuries of wind and water erosion have sculpted an amazing array of unique rock formations. Here, Rose is taking in some of the landscape. Light rain and snow flurries lent a special effect to the rocks. The group then moved south to Angel Peak National Recreation Area where they were greeted with some spectacular views. All in all, the sisters had a great time catching up and seeing the sights. In early March, along with friend Brian Papirello, we took a brief run up Highway 395 on the east side of the Sierras. Along the way, we made a side trip to visit Burrow Schmidt's Tunnel. Schmidt was a prospector who dug this tunnel over the course of 38 years using hand tools and dynamite. The purpose was to provide a shortcut from his home to his mine. These are the Trona Pinnacles where we camped for the night. And this is a shot of the truck near where we camped. And these are the fish rocks near the town of Trona. Jenny barely escaped the jaws of these stone predators. A few weeks later, Jenny and I took our Jeep up into the local forest to recon a good camp spot for an upcoming visit by friends Brian and Maria. We had taken the top off the Jeep for a few months, which made this day trip a lot of fun. Here, we are camped with the aforementioned Papirellos a few weeks later. These jagged granite outcroppings are also known as the Pinnacles, but are in no relation to the ones we saw earlier in Trona. Brian, Maria, and me. Brian and Maria. In July, we, along with the Papirillos and Scott and Marta Donovan, spent the better part of a week on dirt roads crossing the Sierras from Springville to the Owens Valley. Our first stop was the Trail of a Hundred Giants. This is one of the largest concentrations of giant sequoias in the world. At this point on the walk, the trail takes you under one of the fallen giants. Scott and Marta hiking to a fire lookout high in the Sierras. Said fire lookout.
And this is a typical campsite on that trip. The road descending from the east side of the Sierras to the floor of the Owens Valley. Scott and Marta needed to return home to Arizona, so we parted company with them and continued making our way north on Highway 395. This goofy rock formation is located in the Alabama hills near the town of Lone Pine. As we often do when in this area, we stopped at Manzanar, a former World War II relocation center for Japanese Americans. Our next stop was the Bristlecone Pines located in the White Mountains on the eastern flanks of the Owens Valley. Bristlecone pines are the oldest living organisms, with one specimen named Methuselah having a verified age of 4,855 years. The trees grow at high elevations just below the tree line and have evolved the ability to survive a wide array of weather extremes. Many of the pines appear to be dead, but that's not the case at all. Leaving the White Mountains. In October, we met up with longtime friends Tom Burge and Bill Matthews at the Vermilion Cliffs National Monument. The monument is located along the border of southern Utah and northern Arizona in an area known as the Arizona Strip. The following photos were taken on a hike through a slot canyon called Wire Pass Canyon. Partway through the canyon, hikers must ascend or descend this primitive ladder in order to continue on. That's Tom and I at the top. Some of the sections are extremely narrow and one has to actually turn sideways to squeeze through. Left to right, we have Tom, Ginny, and Bill at one of the wider sections. Ginny at the top of the ladder on our return trip. Later that day, we traveled to an area of unique rock formations called White Pocket. An abandoned ranch along the trail to White Pocket. The fantastic formations in this area are the result of wind and water erosion. Bill. Bill and Ginny. As you can see, Bill is quite the mountain goat. Tom. Tom learned the hard way that soft sand was abundant in the area surrounding the rock formations. After about 20 minutes of hand digging, 
we got him unstuck and were once again on our way. The next day, we headed north out of the town of Big Water and climbed on a rugged road over Smoky Mountain. As we gained elevation, the waters of Lake Powell became visible in the distance to the south. Smoky Mountain gets its name from an underground coal seam fire that's been smoldering for thousands of years. Some of the areas of the mountain have vents which allow smoke from deep in the earth to escape to the surface. The trail follows a narrow canyon through rough but beautiful terrain. We all decided that Smoky Mountain is a place that we hope to explore more fully at some time in the not too distant future. After about 75 miles, Smoky Mountain Road terminates when it crosses the famous east-west oriented Hole in the Rock Trail. At this point, we parted company with Tom and Bill. They had an archeological project scheduled that was to begin the following day down near the north rim of the Grand Canyon. So we shook hands and they went west on the Hole in the Rock Trail and Jenny and I headed east to check out the Hole in the Rock, a place we'd never been. Despite the fairly remote nature of this area, the trail attracts quite a few tourists in a wide variety of off-road vehicles. From the trailhead near the town of Escalante to the Hole in the Rock is about 75 miles each way and the road surface is really beat up. In 1880, a group of Mormons who were attempting to settle a new area to the southeast were faced with the challenge of crossing the Colorado River and surrounding cliffs to reach their destination. The following pictures are of the hole in the rock. This slot had to be widened using hand tools to accommodate the 26 wagons in the group. Once through the slot, the pioneers had to construct a hundred foot long dugway on the cliff face. Once off the dugway, the wagons could negotiate a rough trail down to the level of the river where they were loaded onto a barge to cross the river. This was a remarkable story of engineering, perseverance, and faith. After spending some time at the Hole in the Rock, we made the bone-jarring return trip to Escalante, then north over Boulder Mountain to the town of Boulder and the western end of the Burr Trail. The scenic Burr Trail wends its way down to a major geologic feature known as the San Rafael Swell and the southern end of Capitol Reef National Park. We worked our way north in the swell until we reached one of the access roads to the southeastern corner of the Henry Mountains. The Henrys are a longtime favorite of ours and a place to cool off when the temperatures are hot in the surrounding desert. The highest point in the range is Mount Ellen at over 11,000 feet and there are lots of places to camp and cool off. Here I am relaxing among the pines. War of the Henrys. After a quick resupply in Hanksville, Ginny and I traveled north to a spot called the Wedge Overlook. Along the way, we stopped at and investigated several rock art sites.
A view from our campsite at the Wedge, which is also known as the Little Grand Canyon. Ginny taking in the views. As we were leaving the wedge a few days later, we ran into these pronghorn antelope. The next few photos were taken at and around a rock art site called Sinbad. This underpass is one of the only ways for vehicles to cross Interstate 70. As you can see, people have stacked up rocks to form a primitive ramp here. Unfortunately, our ground clearance was not quite adequate and we scraped the bottom of the truck while descending the ramp. As we worked our way south, we encountered a few additional rock art sites along the way. Some pretty fall colors near the town of Kanab. This trip ended for us with a quick stop at Gold Butte National Monument near Mesquite, Nevada. From there was on to Springville. The next outing was a weekend at the Carrizo Plains with Brian and Maria. Here's the group on a short hike. Sunset at our campsite on the Carrizo. We met up once again with Tom Burge on our last trip of 2020. We all drove to one of the north rim of the Grand Canyon's remote overlooks called Kanab Point. Both of our trucks got pretty scratched up from the foliage, but we all felt it was worth it. Tom was serving a two week stint as a monitor in the area to keep an eye on hunters. He had helped out the National Park Service Ranger in this area on numerous occasions and his services are highly valued. The following photos are from the spot that we camped on Kanab Point. Not a bad place to sit and relax at the end of the day.
The next morning, we parted ways with Tom and set out to do some exploring on our own. While climbing Mount Trumbull, this big guy crossed the trail in front of us. Earlier, I mentioned that this was hunting season, and I'm sure that any deer hunter in the area would have given his left eye to bring this buck down. We shoot him off into the brush so he could avoid having his head hanging above someone's fireplace mantle. Our intention was to cut through the mountains to the west of us and take a shortcut over to Mesquite, Nevada, where we would head home from there. Unfortunately, two mistakes almost put us into some big trouble. Mistake number one was when I read the map wrong and turned onto the wrong trail. Mistake number two was listening to a guy that we met along the trail who told us that the road we were on would indeed take us as a shortcut to Mesquite. Descending the mountain, the trail became more and more rugged. It was getting late in the day and the steep trail showed no signs of easing up. Additionally, the fuel gauge on our truck was reading pretty low. We were just starting to get worried when we ran into two vehicles coming up the trail with flashing red and blue police lights. It turned out they were two members of the local search and rescue squad. They informed us that there was no way that our truck would make it through the boulder-strewn trail that lay ahead of us. They were each driving side-by-side -side razors that had been set up for extreme off-road. They lived in Mesquite and offered to guide us there. We took them up on their offer and for the next few hours followed them through some very difficult terrain and the encroaching darkness. I would not say that these two guys saved our lives, but they likely saved us from some severe damage to our truck and an uncomfortable night in the boondocks. The last hour was spent on a rough trail in almost complete darkness. When we arrived in Mesquite, we breathed a sigh of relief and decided to take a hotel room for the night. Thanks for watching our slideshow. We hope you enjoyed it.